My name is Leif from UC San Diego. Thank you so much. This is a really interesting talk. Um, so we, we, we struggle with all these multidisciplinary discussions all the time in our patients with Fontan. And uh, I, I, you know, I remember probably 10 different meetings before we've added uh, a Fontan, uh, which went successfully, but you know, that's how much it takes. Uh, I have two questions, one for Jeanette uh, and another for, for you, Lee. Mm -hmm. So Jeanette, you know, we run sometimes into the problem of over communication. You know, when we, when we show up, to, uh, you know, other teams see us, ACHD, like in their minds, oh my God, here we go. Um, we really, you know, I, I'd like to think everybody cares about their patients, but we, uh, you know, we see them so frequently and we know them so well. Um, one issue is, you know, some people may think they're thinking hat off uh, when they see our patients and maybe rely too heavily on ACHD. Do you ever see, you know, sometimes in certain scenarios that are more or less bread or butter problems um, become an issue in our patients just because of this uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, over communication or us being over guarding of our patients? The advantage that we have at UCLA is that we've had a center here for 30 years. <laughs> and over that 30 years, the, everyone in the hospital has learned about our program, learned about 40, sorry, 40, um, learned about our program, learned about our patients, learned what to expect from our team and our patients. And so I think because of that history, we don't run into that issue quite as much as you probably do, being someone who's building a newer program in a new place. Um, it's tough. You want to try to, again, accelerate that process as much as you can, but also understand that building that trust, building that relationship um, does take time. Um, and there's only in so many shortcuts you're going to be able to find. Thanks. So, Lee, uh, the question of these Fontan circulation pumps. You know, in my mind, when I think of Fontan failure, you have some of the pure cardiomyopathy, just a pump failure. Those are relatively easy to manage. And then you have this hodgepodge of heterogeneous Fontan failure patients. The ventricle looks more or less OK, but most of the time, it's not 100% OK. There's diastolic dysfunction, there's AV valve regurgitation, there's outflow tract obstruction, and there's often a com complex interaction of all of the above. Do you think it's just as simple as putting a pump in the venous side is going to solve the problem, or are we going to flood the left side once we put a pump in there? Yeah, I mean, I think that's definitely one of the risks. And a lot of people have argued, even for right-sided failure, that maybe if you support the left side, that you're going to suck you know, blood through the system and actually offload you know, the right side and your liver and, 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 and the such. Um, but I think these are the most troubling patients, are the ones that look like they have preserved systolic function, but then have right-sided heart failure type symptoms. Um, I think we're still in the experimental phase. I, I really don't know if we can say for sure that we can insert a pump on that side. I think the, that there's certainly optimism for some of the more miniaturized type things like the circulite and stuff like that that were coming out that might be able to just offload by a liter or two. Um, but there's a lot of hurdles that we have to get over in order to achieve that. Thank you. Steve Dolan, University of Washington. That was a great talk. Thank you all. Um, I have a question for Dr. Cruz and then anybody else who wants to off, um, offer an answer. So I really liked the sort of favors risk versus favors benefit sort of approach. I think that's very helpful. Are, do you all have like red lines when you cross a certain number of things on the favors risk column, or how do you manage that? Because the patient that you that the second patient you presented seems like there would other places would have said there would have been potentially red lines. Uh, thank you for the question, and I think that that's pretty. She met, I think, the comfort level on multiple. Uh, in multiple ways, she uh, pushed our limits. But I do think that, um, you know, you, you want to draw those red lines up front. So that's why I mentioned that actually in Jeanette's note, she documents nicely that we actually tell her if she doesn't respond to desensitization round one, we're not going to keep going because we know what that means. We know the responders typically are going to respond pretty well the first round. And um, we think it's unfair to hold out um, a reasonable hope. So, so yeah, for sure, I think we have to hold each other accountable to that. Um, you know, sometimes it's your own patient and, and you uh, want very badly not to take them off the list. Um, but I do think that those red lines um, are important. I think our wait list, 
um, mortality in Fontanas has been outstanding because we've been so obsessive up front before we actually list them, we actually really think, can we do this? And so that's not been a big area of weakness, pro probably because we turned away patients we didn't think we could do. And I just wanna make one comment and about the VADs. As a non-congenital heart disease specialist, what I worry about is, is um, as, as we saw, these are already really high-risk patients. You throw a VAD into the mix, and what does that do to your base rate? You know, I, I have to believe that automatically the VAD may make them better, but it can also increase coagulopathy and everything else that goes along with it. So it's kind of frightening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think because we have been able to manage a lot of our patients without using VADs, we've been able to, to sort of stave off, you know, having um, an experience there. Uh, but, you know, point well taken. Uh, I think also as a center that often evaluates um, patients who have been denied at other centers, we often struggle with what the red line is. Um, and I think we have a group of people that want to do the best thing for patients. And I also think there's a regional sort of sense of responsibility that some of the bigger centers, I know that Stanford does this, I know that Penn does this, and all these, every in Washington as well, like that, that everybody's trying to um, understand and do right by the patients and not think that I, we are only serving our population in our small little, er, little area because as congenital patients, only certain centers are gonna be equipped to do this. Um, and, and unfortunately, um, the UNOS sort of, and, and the risk stratification for things haven't caught up to that. And my hope is that over time, that, that the discussions in UNOS and the discussions uh, you know, in the community continue to make sure that places that are willing to take care of some of the hardest patients aren't penalized in the long run. Thank you for this wonderful conference. Uh, Anitra Ram from Stanford. Um, had a couple questions, one with regards to the ability to apply for exceptions for our patients. Previously we had struggled and uh, especially, particularly with the need to have this PA catheter in place and I'm very happy that Currently, that's been taken out, at least for status three, I believe, when we were just reviewing that document. Um, but I still wonder about keeping those guidelines of 7.5 mics per kilo per minute of dobutamine and th those higher, just like we would do for a two-ventricle circulation, keeping those with the arrhythmic risk. I was wondering you could speak to that. And then two, if someone could speak to... Um, in looking at the multi-organ, does anyone use cisstatin C in terms of looking at Fontan and, and renal function? Eugene, you want to field the exception question? Sure. I mean, as, as far as the, the exceptions with the congenital patients, uh, the, the guidance document from UNOS is, is pretty uh, lenient to the congenital patients in that they, they like them to be on the hydrocyanotrope or low dose cyanotropes, but they also put in there Second. the maximally tolerated. So okay. it kind of okay. It, there's wiggle room. There's, then. there's wiggle room there, and you know, having participated in the review committees this past uh, the first quarter of this year, uh, the I, I find that the review boards have been uh, fairly lenient to the, the general population. I think the guidance document helps and provides that uh, you know understanding that this population is very different than the dilated cardiomyopathies or ischemic cardiomyopathies. Do you want to feel that? <laughs> We're not using that for assistance okay. okay. for. <laughs> I, I don't have, know the data on that one, sorry. All right, any other questions? Um, we'll go ahead and break for a coffee. Um, we'll come back in about 15 minutes.